He's finally got to make himself look like Miss Tapeworm, did it? The crown is falling into the wrong hands even quicker than last time. The dragon's fine didn't see Mr. Downcast as he should have been. But Hiccup is the heir. I know that now. There is no doubt about it. The sky was very dark now, deep with thunderclouds so close above their heads that Puff Lake could reach out and touch them. Everyone felt in a bewildered way that the world had turned upside down. They had just banished Derek the Vast, who most people agreed was a thoroughly nice chap, an old burglar, of course, but generally thought to be a good Viking and one of them. Now the chief of the outcast was about to be made their king. What was going on? They had been tricked, but they couldn't quite put their hairy fingers on how it had happened. The dragons were tense, their cat's eyes gleaming in the darkness, down on their haunches, muscles poised for flight. Only minutes ago they were in touching distance of freedom, but a minute can be a long time. A new lord for the Vikings meant a new lord for themselves, too. What would it mean? Who was this treacherous human and what did he stand for? Alvin threw back his cloak and strode to the centre of the battle arena, swelling with triumph. He had been a handsome man once, and you could still see that in the ruins of his face, scarred like a fallen angel. You could still see that in the grace and elegance of the ironic bow he made to Hiccup. I'm only sorry, he smiled, as charming as if he were at an evening feast, that we did not meet in battle one last time, Hiccup remembers Hazard the Third. But I'm sure you are not a poor loser, his voice turned to iron. And over the storm blade and the king's things. One by one, Hiccup handed them over. The storm blade, the worm and shield, the ticking thing, the key that opens all locks, the arrow from the land that did not exist. It was not, is it? The bright bracelet with the ruby heart stone, the crown, and last of all, the sword, Hiccup, his hand over the sword. The dragon jewel was hers. She knew it, for the sword would point the way. Oh yes, it is the triumph of the treacherous at last for you, Alvin. You are king. With that, the witch went down upon her knees and knelt before her son, the new king. Graciously, Alvin allowed her to kiss his hand. You see how sometimes it's not clear what story we're telling from the outset, but the story we've just been a part of, it turns out, has not just been about the making of a hero, but also the making of a villain. The Alvin that we first met many books and years ago was not the same terrible man who is now about to be Round upon the castle that was once with flashbands. Well, first we saw him, he was a charming, sneaking, elegant sort of fellow, barely able to hold his own in a sword fight. Since then, dreadful things have happened to Arvin. All his own fault, of course, but he has suffered nonetheless. Suffering can, of course, make a man a better, a better person. But with Alvin, it went the other way, and it had made him far, far worse. With every ghastly experience, he lost a little more of his humanity. Now he stands muscled, hardened, brutal and merciless, a truly awful man indeed to wield the power he would hold from now on. Alvin took the crown, pushed on his head and turned to face the still silent crowd. The witch gave a sigh of the purest satisfaction. And now, Alvin said to Hickolene, almost collapsedly dressed in a hiccup, put this slave boy and his father into chains and throw them to the ugly thug slave lands, never to return. Put the mark upon the father too as a sign how he betrayed his own people. Friends, barbarians and Vikings, he yelled. He thrust the endeavour in the air. Let me tell you what kind of king I am going to be. I've not come to set your dragons free, sneered Alvin the Treacherous. I wish you just sit back and let them destroy our world. I say no and again no. From now on I will declare war of the most dreadful and bloody kind on all the dragons. <gasps> the triumph now. Let me tell you what kind of king I am going to be. All wild dragons must be killed on sight with our north bows and our axes and the most fanciful instruments of human ingenuity. We will seek out their nests, set fire to their habitats, oh no, destroy their eggs and their hibernating young. Alvin was drunk on power now, and as for the domestic dragons, he purred gloatingly. Alvin had never liked dragons of any kind, and here was his chance for a revenge. Dangerous times call for drastic measures. All drastic dragons should be chained at all times unless they are doing a job for a human. They shall spend their nights in cages. Any hint of rebellion and they will all be killed on the spot. There was a silence as these words sank in. This was too much even for the meaner tribes, the murderous and the vicar visitors. One person clapped, the witch. He cannot rule over us, cried Kamikaze. Oh, I'm sorry, purred the witch. Don't you remember? Promise is a promise if it is made in blood. No, shouted take up. No, you mustn't do this. You'll anger our dragons into joining the rebellion. They'll turn against us. Coward, sneered Alvin the Treacherous. Keep calm, cried King okay, up to the dragons and dragonesses all around them. He could hear the dragons beginning to scream and snarl. Not even the tough tribes agree with him. They just need a bit of time to see sense. Don't do anything stupid. Nobody do anything stupid. But it was too late. 
Oh. One eye, the saber tooth drive dragon leapt through the crowd like a great white lion, scattering Vikings to all sides. He threw back his head and roared, How dare you, human worm? Us dragons were not born for chains. I, for one, am joining the rebellion. You should be my first victim. He opened his mouth to fight Alvin and half seize him, screeched out Alvin, and ten or twenty burly Vikings tackled the great dragon and pinned him to the ground. Alvin drew the store blade. You, you great white elephant, smiled Alvin, his own main one eye, smiling into the furious dragon dragon's one eye. You'll be the first to die. I shall christen this back battle only with your foul dragon blood, and thus the war begins. But first I will make you blind. Oh no, no, I won't take up, unable to bear it. No, no, no. Alvin raised his sword to bring it down on the helpless dragon's head, but just as he was about to bring it down, the ground between beneath thick Alvin's feet, oh, thank goodness, seemed to buckle and tremble. Really bad, and behind Alvin's head, the witch's fortune telling up that little sinister debt dwelling exploded in front of the Viking's eyes, sending bits of brick and cobweb and destiny charts and birds' bones and the whole messy morass of the witch's room showering all over the crowd. Thank goodness, by complete coincidence, the entire gunky, stinky contents of one of the witch's squadrons landed on her head, along with the sign saying, Fortune told, futures improved, and a great gush of fire shot through the hole where the hut once was, 200 feet up into the air, as if someone had struck fire instead of oil, like a great geezer of flame. Chapter 21, the court collapse of the castle. Thank goodness that happened. I have a feeling it might be our dragon furious. Well, we're here tomorrow.